Justice's virtual panel discussion um, entitled, In Modern Antitrust pa Paradox, the Consumer Welfare Standard and Recent Proposals. I'm your host, Ashley Baker, and I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Committee for Justice. And now I'm going to introduce our panelists in the order in which they will be speaking. Maureen Olhausen chairs the antitrust group at Baker Botts LLP, where she focuses on competition, privacy, and regulatory issues, and frequently represents clients in the tech, life sciences, energy, and retail industries. She served as acting FTC chairman from January 2017 to May 2018, and as a commissioner starting in 2012. She directed all FTC competition and consumer protection work with an emphasis on technology issues. Olhausen has published dozens of articles on antitrust, privacy, regulation, FTC litigation, and telecommunications law issues, and has testified over a dozen times before Congress. She has received numerous awards, including the FTC's Robert Blotsky Lifetime Achievement Award. Prior to serving as a commissioner, Olhausen led the FTC's Internet Access Task Force and headed the FTC Practice Group at a leading communications law firm. Olhausen clerked at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Jeffrey Manny is the president and founder of the International Center for Law and Economics, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research center based in Portland, Oregon, and a distinguished fellow at Northwestern University's Center on Law, Business, and Economics. Manny is an expert in the economic analysis of law, focusing primarily on antitrust, telecom, IP, and the regulation of technology. After teaching law and economics, international economic regulation, corporations, and other courses at Lewis and Clark Law School for several years, he decamped to work in Microsoft Legal and Corporate Affairs Department. He subsequently founded ICLE in 2009. In 2017, he was appointed by FCC Chairman Ajit Pai to a two-year term in the FCC's Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee. And before that, he served for two years on the FCC's Consumer Advisory Committee. Joshua Wright is university professor at, and the executive director of the Global Antitrust Institute at Scalia Law School at George Mason University. Professor Wright also holds a courtesy appointment in the Department of Economics. In 2013, the Senate unanimously confirmed Professor Wright as a member of the FTC. He joined Scalia Law School as a full-time faculty member in fall of 2015. Professor Wright is a leading scholar in antitrust law, economics, intellectual property, and consumer pro protection, and he has published more than 100 articles and book chapters, co-authored a leading antitrust case book, and edited several book volumes. He was awarded the Paul M. Bater Award by the Federal Society in 2014. Wright previously served in the FTC in the Bureau of Competition as its inaugural scholar in residence. Wright's return to the FTC as a commissioner marked his fourth stint at the agency after having served as an intern in both the Bureau of Economics and Bureau of Competition. So now just a few, house tipping, uh, few housekeeping um, notes. Um, the Q&A function in Zoom at the bottom, that's how you guys can ask questions for the Q&A section. I leave that open throughout the entire panel, so if you want to go ahead and ask a question, I can queue that up for whatever we have the Q&A section, section at the very end, as opposed to you know activating your um, your speaker and your um, camera, we can just do it that way. It's a lot easier for you guys. So feel free to send questions whenever and I will get to as many of them as possible. Um, and with that note, Maureen, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much, Ashley. I'm delighted to be here and to be with my friends, uh, Josh and Jeff, to talk about this uh, very hot topic. Antitrust has become a very hot, hot topic these days. And I think part of the impetus for why antitrust now is so much uh, in, in the public debate goes back to um, concerns over a perceived lack of competition. So sort of the, a drumbeat started maybe around 2014, 2015, accelerated in 2016 about the idea that um, competition has been, you know, concentration has increased, uh, which must mean there's less competition, which must mean there's a problem with antitrust enforcement and the antitrust laws. And that kind of brings us, I think, to, to the, the kinds of debates that are going on today. And some of the calls for changes focus on things like the size of entities rather than competitive impacts of transactions and abilities of, of companies to change and to innovate and to grow, um, and also ideas to impose broad new obligations on companies that are established players in the market. And these approaches are kind of uh, moving away from, from or, or in some cases, you know, rejecting um, the consumer welfare standard that has been driving antitrust uh, enforcement uh, and case law for, for a number of years. 
Um, so I think it's really uh, key to think about what is the current status of antitrust law and the focus on co consumer welfare uh, allow antitrust to do before we start to say it should really be doing something different. Because I think some of this debate is taking place uh, without a full understanding of what antitrust law can already, um, can already achieve now. And also what are some of the risks of giving it a different uh, mission or, or perhaps some competing or conflicting values to pursue. So antitrust law now is really focused on the idea of the alleged conduct's impact on the competitive process. And the competitive process, the way I look at it, is how a firm makes its decisions on things like price and quality and the need to innovate, among other terms. Looking to the market and saying, what do, what do we have to do to continue uh, to, grow, uh, to grow our market share or maintain our market share? Uh, but antitrust isn't supposed to be like there's a problem, there's something happening in the market that some people don't like. Therefore, antitrust is the tool to use, uh, even if that problem that's being identified is wholly divorced from the competitive process. So we have things like concerns about like fairness or consumer privacy or the protection of small business being raised as an um, as competitive or any or problems that antitrust should should be addressing and i think it's important to think about if you have those kinds of issues uh is antitrust really the right tool for that or should we be looking to other tools really regu regulatory tools to to address those uh one of my other concerns is that once you start taking antitrust and expanding its mission to cover all these different values about um, you know, whether it be privacy, whether it be uh, you know small business, something that's divorced from what's happening in the on the competitive landscape in the market. Uh, you start moving away from the type of expertise that antitrust agencies and antitrust enforcers have to bring to bear, and the tools that we usually use to address these kinds of issues through um, legislation, detailed legislation that gives, um, uh, you know, missions to uh, specialty uh, enforcers and, and agencies, kind of making antitrust be the, uh, the, the jack of all trades, the expert in, in every um, subject matter, I think uh, runs some risks. So for, for antitrust enforcement uh, in, in the modern era, um, enforcers have, you know, intervene where there's evidence that firms are corrupting or likely to corrupt the competitive process through means other than competition on the merits. So what do we mean by competition on the merits? It means that a company uh, is, is getting um, its uh, market share, its market uh, position through it has superior skill, industry foresight, that kind of goes back to an old, an old case. Um, and, and one of my big concerns about some of the reform proposals is they're focused on straitjacketing companies, even if the things that companies want to do are actually going to serve consumers better. They might reduce prices, they might innovate, they might um, open up new markets. So I think we need to be proceeding with particular care here in saying, uh, companies that have been successful thus far aren't allowed to continue to try to serve consumers better to, to, to compete on the merits that way. But even with this focus on the competitive uh, process and competing on the merits, uh, current antitrust law uh, can still address many of the concerns that people have been raising in today's commentary. But what we need is a factual and uh, grounding in economic evidence of a cognizable competitive harm. Um, and then um, things, you know, like issues, concerns about price effects or reductions in quality or impacts on innovation and even so-called killer acquisitions of nascent competitors can be addressed through current antitrust law tools. So for example, antitrust can and has addressed monopolistic conduct um, by and, and any competitive behavior by uh, companies, including innovative technology companies uh, who are doing things that aren't competing on the merits. So if you think back to the very important 
DC Circuit opinion in the Microsoft matter, um, among the many things that that case teaches, is that um, a dominant provider must maintain its position through legitimate competition on the merits rather than through exclusionary conduct that has little or no purpose beyond disadvantaging rivals. So that's a very important touchstone case um, to look at, particularly in the focus today on um, you know, concerns about big, big tech companies. So some of the proposals, and I, I know my co-panelists might go into them more deeply, want to uh, change antitrust law to do things like um, prohibiting a platform from also serving as a merchant uh, on its own platform. So for example, if you're a retailer over a certain size, you can't offer a house or um, a brand product. And you know, the, I, when you think about that, I'm, I, I have serious concerns about that being good for consumers. You know, house brands, low cost brand, um, com generic brands are, um, are often very popular with lower income consumers and they're seen as offering an important, uh, you know, another type of competitor in the marketplace to the to the national brands of products. So um, I, I seriously question how that would improve competition and make consumers better off. Um, the other thing about this focus on uh, companies uh, acquiring nascent competitors, there, there are some real downsides to having some sort of categorical prohibition on acquisitions of small entities. Uh, by larger companies, because what we've seen and what the economic uh, evidence uh, ha has shown um, is that experienced companies often frequently are able to bring these products to market in a way that the smaller company couldn't have, and that the possibility of a bigger company acquiring the smaller company is what drives the investment and the innovation in these startups to, to begin with. So uh, we, we could end up actually making um, competitive or um, funding conditions worse off for these small players if we, if we draw the lines in the wrong, uh, the wrong place. Um, then I'll, st I'll stop after this. Well, you just one other concern is suggesting banning all big mergers, right? Regardless of the, the impact on competition that, you know, oh, you can't get above a big, uh, certain size. You, you can't continue to, you know, uh, to grow even into totally um, new markets. Um, and one of the concerns that I have here is if, we're, if we want to allow companies the ability to continue to compete and to, to pivot to, to take on you know, strong competitors in other markets, I'm very concerned about prohibitions like this. So for example, you think about how Walmart a few years ago bought jet.com so it could compete better with Amazon. Um, and we need to seriously think about the fact whether pro uh, a prohibition on that type of repositioning um, uh, merger just because the one company is above a certain size may actually make consumers worse off. And and just to kind of finish up, I, I have concerns about, as I said, moving away from antitrust singular focus on consumer welfare and the market process. Because once you start putting other values into that, um, how is an antitrust enforcer supposed to balance the effect on competitors versus the effect on, you know, on consumers versus the effect on privacy or on, you know, what, what other popular value is supposed to go in, into the mix. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I kind of laid out a few issues, but I, I think it's important to start this uh, inquiry with an understanding of what the consumer welfare standard can already address in, in antitrust, because I think that's a little underappreciated. Thank you, Maureen. Jeff? Great, thanks, Ashley, and thanks, Maureen. Um, uh, I'll start by saying I incorporate everything Maureen said by reference. Um, uh, I, I think she's spot on with her, um, with her analysis of some of the frailties of some of the proposals we're seeing. And I thought I would talk a little bit more, uh, in a little bit more detail about uh, some of the some of what seems to be driving the the efforts to radically reform antitrust um, and what I see as the real lack of evidence um, and support for the things that seem to be driving it forward. 
Um, so the first thing, as Maureen mentioned, is the sense that we have, um, a, 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 excuse the phrase, a pandemic of, of increasing concentration and market power um, that has been driven by insufficient antitrust enforcement, which itself in turn has been driven by horrible court decisions and ultimately, apparently, the blame all lies on Robert Bork. Um, and uh, the problem with that narrative, which again, really is driving a lot of the concerns here um, or is, is used to justify the concerns that are being made, uh, being stated. Um, the problem with that is that it doesn't really comport with the evidence. Now, there is some evidence that we're seeing increases in concentration um, measured in certain ways. Um, people are probably familiar with uh, Philippon's book, uh, with some of the work of scholars like uh, Deloker and Ekout, um, who have tried to document these big sectoral changes in, in concentration in these markets, and to assert that it's problematic, that it increases um, prices, that it lowers wages for workers, that it increases inequality, it kills cat, kittens and puppies, it really is, is, does everything uh, bad in the world. Um, and it turns out the data is a lot more complicated than that. And we obviously don't have time to go into a, it in great detail here, but it's worth noting a couple of aspects of it. Um, so to me, the most important thing is that the data is, um, is the data that's used to draw these conclusions is itself based on industry classifications. So in other words, you define an industry, you say, here's the number of firms in this industry, and uh, there used to be 10 firms, now there's five, how horrible. And by the way, prices are going up. Um, uh, the problem with that, using that in an antitrust context is those industry classifications often have very little to do with antitrust relevant markets. Um, in one particular sense that becomes really important in this literature, those classifications, of course, are all uh, assessed at a national level. Um, but if you think about it, a lot of competition, and in many markets, all competition, actually occurs at local levels. So, for example, if, if um, we're seeing an increase in concentration, this is not true, but I'm just using this example, in grocery stores nationally, um, but in my neighborhood in Portland, Oregon, it turns out there's, there's five national chains and uh, 16 local stores that are competing with each other. The increase in concentration at a national level that may be occurring doesn't really affect me uh, because I have massive competition here at the local level. And it turns out that that's exactly what the interesting take on the data is showing, that um, we're seeing, by most measures, this increase in concentration at the national level but it turns out we're, uh, yeah, sorry, increase in concentration at the national level. At the local level, we're seeing exactly the opposite, an increase in competition. And the story behind that is really fascinating. It turns out that increases in uh, uh, the application of new technology is enabling firms to expand into more markets than they could before. It's creating economies of scale and scope. And so you're having a lot of big firms that are starting to compete in local markets that they might not have competed in before. And it's true that again, at the national level, you may be seeing an increase in concentration because these firms are franchising. They're maybe buying up some of the local stores. They're increasing in, in size nominally. And yet again, at the local level, they're actually entering into more markets and bringing more competition. And if you look at the data, uh, the way some scholars have, and, and I think look at it at the more appropriate level, the, the entire narrative really falls apart. It turns out that the primary motivation for upending the antitrust laws doesn't really seem to be an accurate description of the economy. And what's more, as I suggested, um, there's really no way to tie it, to, even if it were happening, there appears to be no good way to tie it to problems of antitrust enforcement or antitrust law. So you'll hear claims that uh, the agencies don't enforce the antitrust laws anymore. They've only brought X number of cases in so many years. Well, it turns out that's not a very accurate description either. It turns out that the number of section two cases, monopolization cases has been pretty 
con constant for a, a very long time and properly adjusted for the number of mergers that are happening, the likelihood of one of the agencies challenging a merger has arguably doubled, but absolutely increased in the last couple of decades. So in other words, if you just count the number of cases, you may see a reduction in the number of merger challenges being brought. Um, but it, it turns out, according to at least some of the data, that doesn't reflect what's really going on and that indeed the number of relative to the uh, number of problematic mergers, the number of investigations is increasing and challenges. And of course, it's inappropriate to count the number of cases to determine the extent to which the antitrust laws are working. And this is one of the crucial points is that the antitrust laws have always operated largely by a deterrent effect. They're, they've been, as Maureen suggested, under the consumer welfare standard, pretty well understood. The, the law is pretty clear here. I, I don't want to say that's too true because it's actually a really complicated and always future looking uh, application of law. So it's never perfectly clear, but the standards are pretty clear. Companies know, you know, with some degree of mar uh, margin of error, whether a potential merger is going to be problematic or not. They don't undertake the problematic mergers so much anymore. Um, and so if you just count the number of cases, you're missing all of the potentially anti-competitive mergers that are never even tried. You miss all of the attempted mergers that are abandoned because the agencies threaten to sue or, or indicate that they think there might be a problem. Uh, and you really don't get an accurate picture of the extent to which antitrust is, um, is affecting the incidence of anti-competitive conduct in the economy. Um, Ashley, do I, I apologize. I didn't notice what time I started. Uh, am I at the end? I, I have much more to say. I, I don't want to, um, I always prefer the Q&A period. So let me know if I have a minute or no, no time. Or One to two minutes. You're fine. Okay. Thanks. Uh, apologies for that. I should have noted the time. Sure. Uh, let me, let me uh, rather than move on to another topic because one minute is not enough time to cover anything. I'll add just one more point to the uh, points I've been making for a few minutes now. Um, it's, it's important, I think, that the majority of attention, certainly in the press, um, uh, and in part because of politics and the press, increasingly so at the agencies, the majority of attention in the antitrust world today seems to be directed at these digital markets, at digital platforms. Maureen discussed some of this, um, and several of the, of the really problematic proposals are very much addressed uh, precisely at these companies. And again, the argument is made that there's insufficient competition in these markets. Now, unlike the macroeconomic evidence I was just discussing, there really is no evidence, um, no empirical, rigorous empirical evidence to support the assumption that there's a lack of competition in these markets. It's just assumed because people think you can look at the number of firms. I mean, there's only five firms that matter, right? So there can't possibly be a lot of competition. And what I wanna stress here and, and finish with is that um, as I intimated earlier, uh, you know, antitrust is a more complicated exercise than that. It, it, is, it is usually an error to rely on superficial or sort of conventional wisdom assumptions um, to get to what antitrust is supposed to be doing, which as Maureen says, is looking at the actual economic effect of business conduct and determining how likely it is to harm consumers. And the superficial, superficial indicia can be very misleading. So I'll end with this. One perfect example here is uh, the assumption that's made in a lot of quarters that uh, Google and Amazon don't really compete with each other. After all, Amazon is an online retailer. Google is an online search engine, although it does lots of other things too. Um, and they're, they're not really in the same uh, relevant market. And indeed, when some cases have been brought against these companies, including in, uh, in Europe, um, and most relevantly in the European case regarding Google's at shopping, at literally its retail related product, Amazon was excluded from the relevant market. Now, right off the bat, you see that that's probably important to establishing the assumption that there is a lack of competition in these markets. But it's also a really flawed assumption, I think. And again, there's not huge um, uh, rigorous evidence here, but you, you can just see the analysis works. You can understand when you learn, for example, that something like two thirds of product searches on the internet now are done in Amazon, not in Google. And the fact that Google has 
of the majority of searches out there um, doesn't really establish a whole lot because the majority of those searches aren't monetizable by Google. I, I like to say, if you search for you know, George Stigler and, and entry barriers, um, no one is buying those keywords to sell their products. Um, uh, it turns out though, that if you're searching for Nikon camera, that's a pretty valuable keyword. And those are the searches that people are doing on Amazon. So in the, in the sort of relevant sphere of competition in this one sort of narrow slice of the market, it seems really inappropriate to assume that, for example, it's just one example, Google and Amazon aren't competing with each other. And yet I do think that assumption is regularly made. It's regularly the, the fact that people will sort of count the number of actors of, uh, excuse me, of firms in a particular superficially defined market and assume that competition is lacking. There's, there are lots of other reasons as well to, to believe that there's rampant competition in these markets. And so to sum up again, I think all of this points to the fact that, that um, the impetus for these claims that we have to do something about antitrust law to fix these problems rests on, on a really frail uh, uh, set of assumptions that, uh, that certainly can't maintain the kind of radical reforms that people are proposing. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Josh? Thanks, Ashley. And it's always a pleasure to follow Maureen and Jeff. Uh, who I think have uh, uh, set the table quite nicely, both in terms of describing uh, what antitrust law actually actually can do and does right now under the consumer welfare standard, uh, as well as talking about about some of the evidence. I think I'm going to start um, sort of zoom uh, out to 30,000 feet and talk about the stakes of this debate a little bit, and then, and then dive into some of the specific proposals that Jeff didn't get a uh, a chance to talk about. Um, it is worth talking about, and I think the description of the, the, the program, actually, uh, in, in referencing uh, Robert Bork, um, I think it's worth talking a little bit about um, where the consumer welfare standard came from. Uh, this debate that we're having doesn't happen in a, uh, in a historical vacuum. And I trust as a, a history that I think reads on the current debate uh, in some important ways. Uh, Maureen talked quite a bit about what we can do now under the consumer uh, under the consumer welfare standard, and 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 I, I to to co-sign um, incorporate by reference those those remarks as well. Uh, but I think it's important to understand where antitrust came from, right? So uh, the consumer welfare and what the consumer welfare standard is, right? Oftentimes in these debates, you'll hear people say, "Well, uh, the consumer welfare standard is we." We add up the benefits and the cost of the conduct and we estimate it to two decimal points and we hire a bunch of expensive economists and if the harm outweighs the benefit, the conduct's illegal. And that's just not what uh, the consumer welfare standard is, right? It's a, the lodestar of, the, of our, our antitrust institutions. We design our rules around it. Sometimes they're per se rules of illegality. We don't do any counting or balancing. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we do some, sometimes we have safe harbors, right? Um, but the thread that is common to all of our antitrust uh, institutions is that this sort of singular focus on consumer welfare guides, uh, guides those decisions. It was not always that way. If you look at antitrust going back uh, sort of, you know, 1890 uh, to the late 60s, uh, if you think of some business conduct in your head right now, I will leave that as an exercise to the reader. What you're thinking was definitely illegal in the 60s, uh, whatever your example was. Uh, most horizontal mergers, basically all vertical mergers, tying arrangements, exclusive dealing, and many of them were felonies. Um, and it was up to the government to decide whether to prosecute you or not. Sort of huge amounts of political uh, discretion and power uh, placed in the hands of uh, the federal government to decide whether to prosecute because essentially everything violated the Sherman Act. Uh, along came the big revolution uh, in the 60s and 70s uh, the revolution that caused Robert Bork to write the antitrust paradox in 1978, and really a series of papers that led into that in 1978, to point out that most of what the antitrust enterprise was doing uh, was antithetical to its stated purpose, right? We were, we were distorting and thwarting competition. We were raising barriers to entry uh, instead of playing an affirmative role in lowering them. Antitrust was, was a mess. And the primary culprit, the sort of diagnosis of Bork and others on all sides of the political spectrum, was the primary culprit for antitrust being an intellectual sort of incoherent backwater uh, 
uh, was that it was serving too many masters at the same time. Antitrust law uh, was to not only protect consumers, but individual competitors, some individual industries, agriculture at the time. Um, it was to do fairness and protect the environment and um, to intervene in uh, labor relationships and, and the like. It was being asked to do too much and it was not doing any, any of it well. And so along with um, sort of that big revolution that happened in the law, you had all of this new economic learning in the 60s and 70s uh, uh, as well. Some of that economic learning to go back to where, where Jeff was started, maybe uh, I mean, there was a lot of economic learning about the way markets worked in the 60s and 70s um, that upended some of the presumptions that built the antitrust law of the, the era prior. But maybe the most important, longest lasting lesson of that era was that competition and concentration aren't the same thing. It's a really bad idea to start using the number of firms uh, or market shares to make inferences about how intense competition is. Um, counting the number of firms with your fingers is not a very sophisticated method of measuring competition and we can do much better now. And so uh, antitrust law has come a long way um, from its in terms of both the economics, what we sort of know about both economic theory and evidence, but the, also in terms of uh, the law and legal institutions and the consumer welfare standard really started, uh, came about in antitrust law in the late seventies uh, and sort of proceeded from GT Sylvania in 1977 to current with a whole bunch of cases that revisit the doctrine of sort of the old pre-consumer welfare era and say, those were bad ideas, let's get rid of it. And instead of having these bright line presumptions of the illegality, instead of counting with our fingers, uh, instead of just declaring broad swaths of uh, conduct unlawful or presuming it to be anti-competitive, let's, let's learn from, um, the economic evidence, and we'll do some analysis in these cases. And so our lodestar will be trying to figure out whether conduct's anti-competitive or not. If we know enough about it, we can make some presumptions, right? But until then, we're just gonna figure it out in individual cases. And so you get GTE and Monsanto and Brook Group and Weyerhaeuser and Legion and Trinco and a whole bunch of cases that come and sort of clean up the mess that antitrust law was. The new criticisms uh, that have been levied at the consumer welfare standard really take two forms. One is within the consumer welfare standard. They say sort of even taking your own consumer welfare standard as the goal, you're not doing a very good job. Um, and they point to a couple of areas. Um, sometimes they make the same mistake as the 1960s and they say, look, if you count the number of firms with your fingers, you don't have to use a lot of fingers. And that tells me a lot something about competition or competitive outcomes. Uh, instead of thinking about actual consumer surplus or are those markets, you know, digital markets are a great example. Are we seeing consumers benefit from rivalry in those, those markets? I think you'd be hard pressed to find uh, a consumer or a participant uh, on, on the call thinking that they are not benefiting from competition in digital markets uh, today. That doesn't mean that there aren't problems, uh, but the traditional way that we've approached those problems with antitrust is case by case analysis. What we're getting instead now, which will take me to some of the, these proposals uh, is a proposal to do away with economic analysis in individual cases, do away with sort of case by case evidentiary sort of roll up your sleeve sort of inquiry that the agencies do now uh, and have bright line presumptions. We can do a lot of cases really fast if we just will use our fingers or come up with other uh, bright line rules. Sometimes we don't even use our two fingers. We just declare all vertical mergers unlawful or we say if a firm is above $40 billion in size, Every, everything they do is unlawful. They can't buy anything. Um, it's not rocket science or even complicated economics to figure out uh, that you are going to leave a lot of money for consumers on the table with those bright line approaches. There are going to be pro-competitive transactions that you declare unlawful uh, and people are going to stop engaging at them. Um, I think from a, a sort of broad perspective, the way that I think about the debate about the, today's consumer welfare standard is really through that lens. I think one of the things that a lot of these proposals have in common is an invitation to reject economic analysis, the sort of economic analysis that guided antitrust law through its history uh, and replace it with two things. One are sort of bright line rules, um, 
you know, firms above X size, no vertical mergers. Uh, there's a proposal that went into the FTC that would take us to the 19, literally would take us into the 1960 uh, uh, merger analysis, the 1968 merger guidelines that firms of 10% share, um, just sort of all, all unlawful. So I think you've got this battle between economics and bright line rules um, and, and really sort of rejecting the analytical framework that uh, brought antitrust out of its incoherent state in the 30s and 40s into sort of a body of law that um, people can counsel clients with and judges can apply. Um, so that's sort of one of the major themes. And I second is I think one that Maureen already touched on, but I'll, I'll sort of end emphasizing uh, now, which is uh, when we invite a body of law, this idea that we'll, we'll do consumer welfare standard and five other things, that, that's, that's not new in antitrust. That is, um, that's something we've done before. That is the, the, the pre-economic roots of antitrust, where we did six things at once and we did it disastrously. Uh, consumers were made worse off. Um, there was, you know, large bipartisan consensus agreement that antitrust law of the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s don't make any sense. Um, I think there's lots of evidence that the antitrust law of that era didn't make any sense. And a lot of what's happening is an invitation, and criticism is an invitation to bring back that era of antitrust in which we trade off consumer welfare. We, we make I mean, we're going to maximize six things at once. You're going to get less consumer welfare. And I think the challenge for the critics of modern antitrust law is what are we going to get for it? We're going to get more what exactly? Uh, fairness or uh, democracy are two of the answers that have been uh, raised by uh, open markets and other critics of the modern antitrust institutions. Um, and that sort of leads to my, my, my final point, right? So bright line rules on the other hand and huge amounts of political discretion on the other, right? To set where the bright lines go and when they're going to be applied, right? Um, and so I think it puts the agencies in a position if a merger can be unlawful either because it harms consumer welfare or it does something to fairness or because uh, the antitrust agency takes a particular view of what it will do to um, economic inequality or fairness or the environment or some such. Uh, in which it does not have the relevant set of expertise, as, as Maureen noted. Um, I think you are inviting a huge consolidation of power with little ability to have judicial review check agency decisions, uh, which I think is incredibly important to discipline agencies, uh, even when the agencies don't want it. Um, and so I think that invitation is, uh, uh, is one that should be uh, rejected. Uh, both on, on both fronts, both on the political injection into antitrust institutions, but also the invitation to reject economic analysis in favor of, of uh, bright line rules that aren't informed by economics or evidence or uh, I think much of anything else. I'll stop there. Thank you, Josh. So I do want to get a bit more into um, antitrust and the courts and where things are now. But um, first, let's think, maybe take another step 30,000 feet back, um, just kind of at the core purpose of antitrust law. I mean, so there, there's a big difference between antitrust law in the United States and the EU. And I like to kind of contrast those two to show, you know, what exactly we are protecting. Is it, I mean, it's really no accident of history, so to speak, that there are no big companies in Europe, particularly big tech companies now. Um, this, the way their regulatory system um, works, um, and a lot of that is due to antitrust. And you know, there you're protecting companies essentially from competition. Here, antitrust law doesn't, you know, serve to protect the company from competition, but rather to protect this consumer. So, you know, what is that core purpose of antitrust law that's really been um, kind of lost on lawmakers in recent years? So uh, let me um, just mention, you have to, you know, kind of as Josh said, look at the roots of why antitrust is what it is. And in Europe, you have to understand that uh, Europe had a lot of state-owned enterprises. Right. And they had their market share and their market power, not from being the best competitor, but because they were the one, you know, they were the government. Right. So when you look at European rules now, a lot of those rules grew out of that idea of you have a big player who inherited their market share because they were the state owned, state -owned enterprise. We don't have that in the U.S. Right. So our approach has been 
uh, different because we didn't we weren't trying to undo that history of state owned state owned enterprises. So I, I think that, that that's that's an important point. One other thing, um, you know, just to mention Europe here. One of the concerns I have about moving away from the consumer welfare standard in the U.S. is it does create um, even greater opportunities for other areas of the world to use industrial policy as the driver for, for antitrust, to pick winners and losers, not based on really antitrust concepts, but kind of like, you know, we, we want our industries to win. And in Europe right now, you have um, Margaret Vestager, who is both the competition commissioner and the minister for digital markets. So you are already seeing kind of this melding of these two missions in a way that, uh, you know, like in, in the US, if you had the Secretary of Commerce also be the head of the antitrust division, I, I think you might say, well, how, how does that work? What values is, is that person pursuing? So, so uh, I, I do think uh, we're, we're seeing a little bit more of that kind of um, melding in Europe in a way that uh, certainly makes me uncomfortable. And I'll say to that, uh, Ashley, if I, if I can uh, jump in, I mean, Maureen raises a great point about the international dimension of this. I mean, when we uh, were at the Federal Trade Commission together, uh, a, a large part of, I think, what we both spent time thinking about was implications for what the U.S. was doing, uh, both in Europe and in China and other places. And, and um, you know, other countries pay attention to what we do and say and, and debate, and it really, and it really matters the way that I think this discourse takes place in the United States in particular, uh, what comes out of the US enforcement agencies uh, with respect to how we talk about our antitrust institutions. Um, you know, enforcement authorities and other, we, for, for decades we've been, the, we being the US agencies have gone around and said, you know what, uh, the consumer welfare standard is a good thing. Economic analysis and, and, and antitrust is a good thing. Um, using the consumer welfare standard to guide your antitrust institutions uh, is a good thing. And, you know, I think it's probably never been more important uh, for the U.S. agencies to continue that message and to uh, be loud and clear about it. And it's a difficult thing to do politically for those agencies right now. The, 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 the politics have changed and um, it's not always popular to say some of those things. Uh, but it has never been more important because uh, those agencies very quickly are going to say, look, even in the U.S., the consumer welfare standards up for grabs. So who are you, uh, U.S., to tell us that we can't uh, protect national champions or, um, you know, our state-owned enterprises or, uh, or pick, pick winners in some sort of important way? Or just use our antitrust laws to extract rents from U.S. tech companies, which is a, a, also a, a popular move. Um, it, I think we uh, are less able to do that credibly uh, unless our antitrust, our leadership at antitrust institutions are sort of standing up loud and clear in defense of uh, our current institutions. Or if they just disagree with that, then to have that debate out loud and, um, and to do it that way. Um, Ashley, I, I, I think I'd like to bring it around to the uh, courts actually and, and um, note that um, well, so everyone who's done policy before, and, and probably a lot of people on the call here, are familiar with um, the, the fact that when you try to bring economics into policy, there are a lot of people who really hate it. Um, and uh, they'll claim that you're being ideological, they'll claim all of these awful, and here you are thinking you're just trying to bring rigorous evidence to the table. And the reason for that, uh, in many cases, is because economics acts as a constraint. Um, if, you know, obviously politics can get around anything at some point, but, you know, if you have front the reality that, for example, the basis for your, your proposed legislation doesn't really hold up to scrutiny, it, you know, it raises the cost of doing the thing it is that you want to do, of exercising your discretion. And uh, the way antitrust works, as we've been talking about, is that courts essentially imbue these very vague and terse antitrust laws with, or since, you know, 1970s, with an economic content. And so uh, you find that for those who have an ends-driven 
objective, who want as much in as possible, of course, are often, you know, opposed to the bringing in of economics. Work in any it's all about economics. But now what you see is that things are challenging the courts quite substantially, which in U.S. antitrust, the sort of primary source of constraints on discretion, on the ability of enforcers to just sort of whatever they want. Most enforcers, of course, including the present company, past enforcers, are, are um, perfectly honored, you know, not intending to do anything wrong. But the courts exert a powerful constraint on things they might do. To bring it back to Europe, that hasn't really been the case in Europe. Um, uh, there are important aspects of sort of process U.S. antitrust law that folks have, like Josh and Maureen have also been trying to, to export to other countries and explain. And Europe has always been um, uh, a real problem in this area with respect to its processes. And in particular, the ability of an independent court to impose constraints on what regulators and enforcers do in Europe is extraordinarily limited. It's not to say it doesn't exist, but it's extremely attenuated. And what concerns me, along with the things that Maureen and Josh was talking about, is that efforts to um, bring these new ideas and, and new proposals to antitrust in the U.S. frequently turn on um, deriding the courts and the way they have have evolved the antitrust law. And there is a real effort to short circuit the courts by, as Josh was suggesting, move to bright line rules where the courts just don't have anything to say about it. And if you do that, you take the economics out of it, like Josh said, but you also take the courts out of it. And that seems like a move in absolutely the wrong direction here. Yeah. I absolutely agree. And I was going to get a little bit into also using antitrust law for purposes other than antitrust, which is, you know, also kind of the end goal of a lot of what you were just saying um, in terms of establishing these bright line rules and some of the proposals um, put forth in Congress. I mean, antitrust is one area of law we've seen, like environmental law, others of tort law that have expanded massively over the years. And antitrust, we've kind of kept constrained to some extent. Um, we've tried at least. Um, but now, we, you know, you see the this expansion of antitrust law that does kind of exclude the courts in some of the ways that Jeff was saying. Um, let me get to some of the questions from the Q&A, though, that all kind of tie into this in one way or another. Um, the first being, on the Hill, what is the overwhelming thought on the antitrust and its evolutions? Are political lines being or have been drawn? Well, I would say they're being drawn. As people may know, the House Judiciary Committee is uh, in the the final weeks or so, we're told, of a year-long investigation into the state of antitrust law and digital markets. Um, all three of us submitted statements and, and offered testimony in this process over the year. Um, it's frequently labeled a bipartisan effort. Um, and I guess nominally it started out that way. I think it's clear that um, that it won't remain bipartisan by the time the, the effort sort of concludes. There are some contrary forces in, in the Republican Party um, who I think unfortunately see bringing down the big tech companies as a more important objective than preserving the rule of law and property rights and the economic content of antitrust. So I think there will be some sort of defectors. But I do, in fact, think that you'll see the expected political lines largely being drawn with the Democrats trying to import all of these social and political objectives into uh, antitrust and the Republicans trying to hold the line. Let me go ahead and pull in another question here just because it's relevant to you know where you left off and um, let maybe Josh and Marie chime in on this. Um, it says, are you sympathetic to any of the concerns motivating the new Brandeis books? If so, what kind of tools would you rather they use to achieve their concerns? Merger review allows a moment in time when the government is already inserting itself into private action, so I can understand the appeal of jumping on that moving train. Would you support, for example, adding something to take advantage of the process of merger review, but serving a completely different goal, perhaps conducted by someone other than DOJ or FTC and completely disconnected from the antitrust analysis? Um, so, so, you know, there, there are plenty of important values that we can have a rational debate about what the regulatory structure should be and where the law should be. So think about privacy, 
right? Privacy, it's a big, big issue, continuing issue. But to try to insert that into an antitrust analysis just because, well, you've got the hood up anyway, right? Why not get in there and tinker more? <laughs> so, so you're creating these like kind of strange rules where what is this, a one-time privacy law and it only applies to the, the people who are, who are merging and it doesn't apply to you know, everyone else who might have equally sensitive data and be using it in a way that we might have uh, c concerns about. So, and, and the same thing for any other value, whether it's, you know, uh, environmentalism or, 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 what, or what, whatever. Um, I don't think that just because you, ha you have that leverage over the parties to try to, to, do, to do it there makes it appropriate or even particularly coherent. Because the, the other thing that you do is you end up creating incentives um, that to, to avoid that process. And I'm not sure that that serves, serves the privacy goal or the environmental goal if it's going to be, you know, kind of forced through that channel uh, of, of merger review. So I think, you know, we, we have other regulatory structures, we have other channels um, that are more consistent, more transparent, maybe bring a little more expertise to the table than an antitrust enforcer can bring. So um, I understand the appeal because of the leverage point, but I, I don't think it's, it would even serve those values particularly well. I think there's a, there's a fundamental choice that, that the, the political lines are being drawn such that I think there's really, um, in the way that the intellectual debate is unfolding, I think there's really a, a fundamental core choice about whether we want to see our antitrust institutions as law enforcement agencies or as super regulators that are going to micromanage not just markets but the internal workings of firms, you know, privacy decisions, environmental decisions, how they structure their pay, how their board is structured. Uh, these are all things that have been proposed that sort of, hey, while we have them here, basically, you know, um, under a clock because they want the merger to get done. Let's see what we can extract from them while we've got a gun to their head. Uh, and maybe we can micromanage the way that the firm is being done and get a whole bunch of other stuff that we want. That whole other bunch of stuff we want it, when we do it through antitrust, it's not going through the political process. It's going through a regulatory agency. Uh, and our traditional way of sort of pursuing these other values is if you want a, an exemption, if you want a privacy law, if you want to change the way that firms are behaving on these other dimensions, you go to Congress and you change the law. Uh, I think most of what we're happening, we're seeing happening now is kind of predictable uh, outcome when um, you don't think you can get the legislation passed. Uh, so we sort of try to jam it through the agencies because say at the FTC, you get you know three votes, you do whatever you want almost. Uh, you don't get judicial review of consents, right? Um, and so I think you're seeing some attempts to strategically do stuff through the agency. Um, you know, it's going to be really hard to do what they want to do under existing Supreme Court doctrine. So that's one of the reasons why you see, I mean, uh, progressive antitrust scholars, you, you know, ones I respect greatly and are, are, are very smart economists and lawyers who 10, 15 years ago would have never wrote that, uh, you know, a unanimous decision like Trinco ought to be overturned. Uh, you, you, you know, because of the great Bork consumer welfare conspiracy, uh, somehow Bork persuaded Ruth Bader Ginsburg to vote with Scalia in that case. It's like a hard theory to tell uh, or even say out loud with a straight face. Uh, but I think where the politics are now, those are the sorts of arguments you're seeing is we got to fix the courts because we can't get stuff done. So let's overturn Trinco and Amex and Twombly and, uh, and the, you know, Brook Group and the rest of it, sort of core antitrust decisions. Um, and I think that's sort of out of, of, out of part uh, frustration with where the law is. But um, I think one, one thing for your listeners to be aware of and, and, and watch uh, in terms of the, the battle fronts, the margins where these, these battles are taking place, uh, I'm sort of skeptical of the legislative attempts to do anything to get rid of the consumer welfare standard. I don't think that's gonna happen. There'll be a lot of talk about it and appropriately so. Uh, but I think the real fights are going to be some of these, um, you know, bright line merger rules. Can we have a ban for mergers above 40 billion and, and so forth, which are effectively doing the same thing as doing away with the consumer welfare standard, just sort of, you know, framed a little bit differently. But if you can't get it done in the courts and you don't win an election, so you can't do it through an agency, uh, 
the way that I think people ought to be thinking about now is through uh, rulemaking um, the, with the FTC in any event uh, with three votes. I mean, there's uh, Commissioner Chopper wrote an article with Lena Khan about sort of dusting off rulemaking through unfair methods of competition. If you can't do it through the courts and you can't do it through legislation, that's sort of the other available option. And I think there's starting to be more noise about, about that. Uh, and so this sort of intersection of administrative law and, and antitrust, uh, not an uncommon intersection for you know folks on the call who follow the FCC or other agencies uh, that do more rulemaking. FTC has stayed away from competition rulemaking, in my view, for a pretty good set of reasons. Uh, but I think that that is a, a a place in addition to legislation and in the courts where we're going to see more of this play out. Um, so I apologize, I'm not going to be able to get to all the questions. We have quite a few here, but um, to tie into that, I think Josh partially answered this question, but um, it says, is the sudden antitrust fever really more of a reaction to Congress's inability to pass other policies that better suit problem areas, for example, privacy laws? Yeah, I think, I think that's, um, I is that's exactly right. Now, I don't, I don't know um, that there is empirical data to prove this, but, but I think the, the, the right lens to see this through is um, that there have been a lot of efforts to, to try to pass progressive uh, laws in a lot of areas um, that haven't happened at the federal level for a long time. And somebody one day woke up and said, look at this statute. I mean, it says nothing. It basically says, you know, don't do anything bad. I mean, we can really use that, can't we? Because not do anything bad could be, you know, don't ruin the environment. Don't uh, sell guns to minors, whatever. Um, and uh, I, obviously I'm being a little bit hyperbolic here, but, but I think in essence, it, it became clear that, that the law was written in such a way that it admitted potentially by on its face of uh, a whole host of things that couldn't happen uh, legislatively, but maybe could happen in the courts. And as Josh points out in the future, I think we're definitely efforts to make it happen um, uh, in regulatory agencies. Um, and important in this is some of the stuff that Josh was talking about. It really is helpful to look back at the history of antitrust because it's not entirely the case that the antitrust laws, when they were written, were intended to look exactly like they're interpreted today. The Consumer Welfare Standard didn't exist in, in 1898, I mean, at least not by name. And <clears throat> um, the legislative history of the Sherman Act is very mixed. It is, there were lots of different diverging, simultaneously diverging um, uh, impetuses for the Sherman Act and Clayton Act and even the FTC Act. And um, I think it's probably no accident that in the early days, the law was utterly unmoored because its origins were utterly unmoored. And you could look back at that history though and see efforts to use the antitrust laws to enact a progressive agenda. Louis Brandeis was absolutely, you know, sort of on board with using the antitrust laws to make a more agrarian economy to, I mean, maybe that's not the right word, but you know, promote locally owned small businesses. He saw big business as the enemy of all things and not just economically. And in fact, he didn't even mind higher prices for consumers if in order to, if that was the price of having more small locally owned businesses, for example. Um, so it wasn't hard, I think, to see that the antitrust written this way, they were probably sort of intentionally for bad reasons this way. And there's a history that they've been used to enact you know, a sort of progressive agenda. So somebody woke up and said, here's the template. We can't do it through Congress. Let's see if we can do it through the courts. And then of course they found out the courts have changed the way the law works now. And there's this big impediment economics that stands in the way. And so now the effort is to overrule these, these judicial decisions. And you know what? It's probably a lot easier in Congress to get Congress to you know, impose a bright line rule that does away with three Supreme Court decisions than it is to get Congress to enact whatever social legislation you want passed. So it's probably the right calculation. Um, and that effort is absolutely underway. Thank you. Um, it seems like we're at the end of our time here. I'm gonna let um, panelists 
finish with any concluding thoughts or any, you know, any lessons from history. I think it's important to kind of look back, like, in 1999, some policymakers thought that, you know, whoever controls the internet browser controls the entire internet. And we see how that played out now. Um, you know, what are your predictions for the future? And do you have just any very brief closing thoughts? Yeah, so, so uh, one of my concerns is kind of where this debate is going next. I think Josh, you know, identified you know, we're trying to say bright line rules and you, you can't, you know, do this kind of merger and you can't do that kind of merger. Uh, and Jeff was talking about taking economics out. And, and I, I agree that those are um, problematic things that are happening now. The next drumbeat that I'm seeing is saying, oh, if you're a big company, it's not that you can't merge. It's that you can't even create new products on your own in this area, this predatory innovation. You know, we just saw a, an article by some um, you know, folks saying, well, oh, you know, it, it's not just buying, it's, it's doing anything. So, so the, the idea that if you are a big successful company, you just have to stay in your lane till you die, no matter what happens in the market, I think is very con concerning. But I think that that's kind of the next iteration, the next step in, in this, in this uh, push towards using antitrust to do something different. I, I think I will just refer back to what I just said essentially is my closing statement and I, I won't uh, belabor the point now I've spoken enough but I agree with Maureen that that it's an area to watch and be cautious about um, because it's been discovered as a potential tool to do uh, a, a lot of potential damage. I will say um... I think one one point I didn't we we didn't touch on, but I think is important for uh, for the debate is I, I think the current structure of the debate has um, conservatives and uh, sort of free market types on on the defense spending ninety nine point nine percent of time on the on the defense because there's a, a fire hose of proposals to do all of the things that Maureen and Jeff and I have, have mentioned whether it's sort of strip out economics or bright line rules or um, uh, you know, to use antitrust to do sort of broad social policy, but also to sort of uh, micromanage the internal workings of firms and their boards and their structure and their design decisions for, um, for, for products like Maureen mentioned. Um, it's hard to think about playing offense when, you know, you're sort of under barrage like that. But I think it's really important uh, for conservatives and sort of free market oriented uh, thinking folks to be, be thinking about offense. We had a, there's a whole host of good ideas out there about reforming antitrust institutions um, in a positive direction that I'm afraid have sort of taken, uh, been put by the wayside because, you know, everybody's playing all defense all the time and, and sort of not playing offense. So it's, it's uh, I think those things are still out there. Um, I, I'm hoping if we're going to have an antitrust moment, where we are going to re-examine inst uh, uh, antitrust institutions, um, let's do the whole re-examination because I think there's a there's a lot to look at. There's um, you know lots of ways in which the horizontal merger guidelines can be improved. Um, you know, if you let me overturn PNB tomorrow, I would I would vote yes and 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 do it. This is sort of a presumption of illegality for horizontal mergers. A repeal Robinson Patman. All sorts of things you could do in the internal workings. Uh, at the agencies as well, not the, not the time or place to talk about them, but just sort of the idea that, um, you know, if we're going to have this antitrust moment, we should, you know, we should be uh, active participants and not just defenders. Thank you, Josh. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for coming out today. We had a great lineup, a great conversation. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for dialing in. And that's it for today. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.